Good afternoon, everybody, from, uh, and good, good morning to those on the West Coast. I want to thank you for joining the webinar, Championing Justice System Collaboration. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Okay, I think we will get started this afternoon with our webinar, Champion Justice System Collaboration. Good afternoon, good morning. Um, I want to again welcome all of you to this webinar for our JMHCP Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program grantees. Um, my name is Risa Hanneberg. I serve as the Deputy Division Director in our Behavior Health Team with the Council State Government's Justice Center. I'm excited for the Justice Center to collaborate with the Justice Management Institute, or JMI, for this webinar that's going to be geared to the role your planning and or collaboration team can play in your work. JMI is the organization that provides support to the National Network of Criminal Justice Coordinating Councils, and many of our leading counties in the country who have a CJCC in place are members of this group. Next slide. To give you an overview of the webinar today, we're going to start with some background and introductions, and then I'll turn things over to Robin Washi from JMI. We plan to facilitate this webinar today as a discussion. So throughout the webinar, please use the question and answer boxes that you will see on your bottom right, um, and enter any kinds of questions or comments, and we are going to be um, co-facilitating the, the webinar this afternoon and pulling in your thoughts and questions as we go. And of course, as usual, there'll be time for questions at the end um, also. So we just want to make sure everybody um, understands the, the process, and uh, we're going to move on to slide three, please. Just a brief um, overview of our agenda today. Um, go back one unit. Um, we're going to, throughout the um, webinar today, there will be some polling questions, and you'll have some instructions for those and then we will be having a panel discussion and then following up with a closing. Next slide. Just a little bit about the Council of State Government's Justice Center. I think many of you are already familiar with us. We're a national nonprofit, nonpartisan, nonpartisan organization that develops research-driven and consensus-based strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. We engage in consensus building, original research, policy change, and providing expert assistance at the intersections of criminal justice and behavioral health. Next slide. The Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, or JMHCP grants, as you already know, being grantees, supports cross-collaboration between criminal justice and behavioral health entities to support people in the justice system who have mental illness and or co-occurring substance use disorder. The Justice Center is proud to be the TA provider for 
to all of the JMHCP grantees. Next slide. And we're also pleased to be working hand in hand with the Bureau of Justice Assistance as the funder of the J JMHCP grant tracks. And here you can read their mission statement. And I'm going to be turning it over to Robin. Hey, thanks, Eunice, for giving me the ball. Uh, that means I have all the power and control now. <laughs> nice to meet all you. I'm Robin Washi, as uh, Riza said, from the Justice Management Institute. And as you can see on the slide here, it talks a little bit about JMI. Uh, we're actually uh, turned 27 years old this year, going on our 28th year. Um, uh, we were founded in 1993, and we are currently located in Arlington, Virginia, which is where I'm calling in from today. And as you can see on the slide, we do a little bit of everything. We do research, education, and training, and also technical assistance, planning, and operations. And as Risa said, we also are uh, uh, the ones that run the NNCJCC, the National Network of Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. And the purpose of that group is really to create a forum for CJCCs, directors, chairs, et cetera, to learn from each other and to build capacity for managing their local criminal justice system. Um, fun fact about the NNCJCC, uh, Riza, who you have already met, and Tom Eberly of JMI are former members of the NNCJCC as they were prior directors of CJCCs. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the other part of NNCJCC is that we also serve as a resource. Uh, we have a website that has resources on it. And of course, this presentation today is part of that giving back to the community to further CJCC. Oopsie. All right, so we are going to move on to some polling questions, and Eunice is going to help me with those. But we're going to start out with my favorite one, uh, where you all are going to put flags on the map where you are. Uh, Eunice, do you want to direct them to see how to do that? Hi, everyone. So if you go to the left hand corner, a uh, left hand side of your screen, um, you should see a white panel, and on that panel, there's a little scribble mark that is for annotating. If you click on that, then there's another pointer button. If you click on that, you will be able to click on the screen um, on the location of your jurisdiction. Oh, yeah. You guys are doing great. Fantastic. So you can see where everybody's calling in from. We got quite a few folks in the Midwest, a few on the East Coast, and a few on the West Coast. Ooh, and Aurora, I see you calling in from Alaska. I think you get the uh, the star for calling from the farthest away. All right, we're going to move on to our first true polling question. So Eunice, I think you have to either clear that or turn it off. I forget how that works. Okay, so the first polling question is, does your jurisdiction have a criminal justice coordinating council? And Eunice is going to walk us through how to answer that. Or actually, you can see it on the right of your screen. So you can pick A, yes, B, no, C, we are considering forming one, or D, I do not know. And Eunice, how are we doing with the answers? Are people submitting okay? Do 
Eunice, how are we coming with the poll? We are more than half, more than half of the attendees have answered the poll, so I'm going to close it out in a couple of seconds. So if you haven't answered the poll, please take the time. Okay, so if I can see the results a little better. Oh, there we go. We have 30% that do have a CJCC, 30% uh, who did not answer, and then 30% who do not know. So it's a little bit of a mixed, mixed bag there. Okay, let's go on to the next polling question. So when will your criminal justice or your criminal courts begin to reopen to the public in your jurisdiction? So the A is it already has or will this month? Uh, B is June 2020, C is July, and D is not sure. So if you could please answer that question to the right and make sure to hit submit once you have selected your answer. And Eunice, how are we doing with the answers to this one? Um, people are starting or finishing up filling it out, so I'm also going to close the poll in a few seconds. Okay, everybody make sure to answer and don't forget to hit the sub submit button in the lower right hand corner. Okay, so we have the results for that one. Results are about 30% will be opening in June, 9% have already opened or are opening this month, 5% uh, are opening in July, and about a third of you, 28%, uh, are not sure and a Few others didn't answer, so we'll we'll put those in the not sure category, which is really actually most of you about half. So that question is really helpful for us, and particularly for our two panelists, uh, as they talk to you a little bit about what their experiences have been through this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. So speaking of of our panelists, uh, we're actually going to turn to the best part of this webcast, which is listening to to them talk about their experiences. So I am going to introduce to you actually our two panelists. You'll see three on the slide. There's a lovely gentleman by the name of Michael Daniels listed in the middle, but unfortunately he was not able to join us today due to the fact that he is under the weather. So we have two panelists for you today. Uh, the first one who I'd like to introduce to you or have her introduce herself is, this is gonna be good, Mandy Potap, Potap wow. I totally seized up there, Mandy. Let me try. Hoda Penko. How'd I do? And Mandy, you are on mute. There you go. Still cannot hear you.
How about now, Mandy? Do you have maybe a second mute on your computer? That's still not working. How about now? You may, want to, you may want to unmute your phone. Oh, that might have worked. How about now? No, darn it. And Abby, I see you're not on camera right now. Um, did you want to pull your camera back on? There she is. Abby, how about if we uh, advance forward to you and have you introduce yourself? Abby Stamp? Okay. Uh, I can hear you now. Okay, good. Good. Um, I see Mandy and I both have Bluetooth headphones and they can be a little a little wonky uh, with the connection. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, yes, I didn't mean to just um, be lurking in the background. I was just waiting for, for my turn. But, and uh, so I'm Abby Stamp. I'm the executive director of the Multnomah County Local Public Safety Coordinating Council, which you can see there on the screen. Um, we call ourselves LPSIC, L-P-F-C-C -C for short. Um, I have been the executive director of LIPSIC in Multnomah County, Oregon for seven years. I've been a county employee for about 16 and Multnomah County um, is at the very top of the state of Oregon, right on the border with Washington and Portland is our large city. Um, the, so the local public safety coordinating council has been around since 1995, subsequent to an Oregon law that was passed in 1994, creating lipsticks across the county. There are 36 Oregon counties and therefore there are 36 lipsticks, all requiring collaboration by law uh, through the state of Oregon. Okay, so now I have both of my fingers crossed. Everybody can see. Mandy, are you there? Darn it, we still can't hear you. you can we hear you? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> I'm sorry, it must have been my AirPods that I had in. So, um, would you like me to proceed with my introduction now? Yes, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. As Robin indicated, my name's Mandy Potopinko. I told her not to worry about the pronunciation of my name because it ends up tripping everyone up once they ask for my permission or, you know, how to spell it. So um, it rhymes with stop and go. That's been the best thing that I've been able to attribute and help people to pronunciate it. But I am the director for Milwaukee County's Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. Uh, I have been in this role now for the last five years. Our council was created by the Milwaukee County Board of Supervisors in 2007. And upon creation, it was named the Milwaukee Community Justice Council, recognizing that um, each of our criminal justice agencies within the county were coming de together to break down silos amongst themselves, but we also couldn't create yet another silo of government. And so we, uh, from the onset, uh, brought community in and have a hybrid approach to the way our criminal justice coordinating council functions. Um, and with that, I'll pause, thank you. Great. Well, as uh, Risa mentioned at the beginning, we really wanted to make this a um, an interactive kind of experience. So the way that we designed this is there's really just uh, three areas that we're going to talk about, which is um, a little bit about how um, uh, Milwaukee and Multnomah adjusted to the uh, uh, the, the pandemic and what the responses were a little bit about um, how they are looking at adjusting going forward and what the future holds. So it's really just a series of a few questions. So as you're listening to them speak, if you have questions for them, I really encourage you to put them in the question and answer, which as Reza mentioned is in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, and we will actually 
you know, very politely interrupt them at an appropriate point and take as many of those questions as we can. So please uh, feel free to do that. So we are actually going to start with Mandy, and I am curious to hear from you, Mandy, about how you were able to maintain your justice system coordination during the pandemic and what challenges you had with that. Thanks, Robin. So in preparation for today, uh, in just reflecting back in the last 10 to 12 weeks, I think there have been three key ingredients that helped Milwaukee County uh, maintain our justice system coordination during this pandemic. First, I think it was uh, starting our planning and response early, as well as meeting frequently. Uh, Milwaukee County began planning for our COVID-19 response before the first cases were even being diagnosed within the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I give tremendous credit to our chief judge, Mary Trigiano, who became chief judge and chair of our CJCC only weeks before planning for the pandemic hit. And um, it was through her leadership and her ability to recognize that being new in her position, she didn't know all the answers right away. And she knew that um, other justice system leaders were having to make difficult decisions like she was. And so um, she convened a, a group in early March. I wish I could take credit for some of that early planning, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, but I was still somewhat oblivious to COVID-19 and sitting on the beach in uh, Florida when that happened. And if you know anything about Wisconsin weather, it was still brutally cold here in Wisconsin. So, um, it was in those early meetings that the justice system leaders came together and recognized that some really difficult decisions had to be made. And by doing them together in consultation with one another, uh, we could be most effective. And also um, by making those decisions together, it's an opportunity for to come as a united front as opposed to um, anyone kind of being pitted against each other during these what can become and did become uh, crisis management scenarios. And so we started uh, meeting three times a week via Zoom at the onset, um, again, which was early March. Uh, and we continued meeting and still continue to meet regularly to make sure that we're all on the same page, both uh, looking forward and reflecting back on some of the changes that have been made. and have been flexible um, throughout this. That's actually number two on my list is really being uh, staying nimble and recognizing that there hasn't been a roadmap for this has been key to maintaining this coordination. We've pulled in public health consultants as we've needed into our planning. Most recently, we've been pulling in facilities planning and other folks to help us in rethinking what it looks like to reopen our courthouse. And so, um, again, just being nimble and recognizing that everyone was doing the best that we can during this time because there is no roadmap has helped us maintain our coordination. And then thirdly, um, as I mentioned, because I was on the beach in Florida during the initial uh, week or so of this planning, uh, I came back and jumped into the middle of our Zoom meetings and was asking a lot of questions and so much had happened in such a short period of time. I really wanted to make sure that uh, the changes happening were being communicated externally to the community and um, and making sure that rumors were not uh, starting that were inaccurate. And so we put out communications early um, as early as we could get them together during all of this planning phase to the community to really emphasize the intentionality and planning that was happening behind the scenes because it is easy for media to pick up uh, headlines that are um, oftentimes, uh, you know, the news flash of the day when in fact there's actually been a lot of collaboration, a lot of coordination, and a lot of thought going in some of those initial 
um, planning and response meetings. And so by getting the word out to community, we recognize that community members and some of our external stakeholders were really cred or, uh, thirsty for credible information. So I think by putting out some of those external facing communications, it was really helpful and actually re-emphasize the importance of all of us working together because that has been uh, really effective in uh, being able to transform our system very quickly. Regarding challenges, um, there have been challenges along the way. Uh, just when we think we've conquered one, there seems to come another. Uh, again, with the initial response for us, we recognized that our courthouse, which houses uh, close to 25 uh, courtrooms, court operations, plus our jail, we have over 4,000 people in and throughout our courthouse complex each day. Uh, we needed to reduce that footprint and do it quickly. Our county had to invest nearly a half million dollars if not more at this point in technology so that staff could begin working remotely. Uh, the chief judge had to issue a number of directives uh, quickly uh, so that our 23 criminal court operations then condensed down into three courts. Um, making transitions in upgrades in technology to allow for uh, things to be sent electronically and uh, virtual discovery among some other things. And so there have been a lot of challenges along the way. And again, I think I, when I think about those challenges and how we've worked through them, it's been consistently meeting frequently and being able to talk through some of those challenges where those relationships have become stronger than they were previously just because of the close nature of the communication that's been going on. And with that, I'll turn it over for Abby and kind of her take from Multnomah. Yeah, thanks, Mandy. That was really instructional. And I particularly enjoy hearing about the communicating with the community, which uh, outside observers sort of looking at all the different places across the United States. I see some places doing an amazing job of that and other places uh, not so much. So that's a really good one. Abby, do you have anything to add about um, what has been happening in Multnomah is related to your system coordination? Yeah, sure. Um, on Friday, March 13th, um, well, let me back up. Uh, every Friday morning at seven o'clock um, uh, Pacific time, we have a leadership meeting to address uh, one of our justice reinvestment in, uh, programs. And so the culture of meeting every Friday morning has been really embedded since late 2012. And so I was able to capitalize on that existing meeting structure to basically pivot um, and be all COVID all the time. Um, so Friday, March 13th, Friday the 13th, uh, was our last in-person meeting. And um, you know it came really fast and heavy. It was like, oh, this is really happening. And then all of a sudden uh, public health leadership said, um, social distancing, three to six feet at the time was the was the direction. Now, you know, it's at least six. Um, and so our meeting in person was in the Multnomah County boardroom, uh, where the Board of County Commission uh, does their business, and we were scattered all over the room. Um, and like Mandy, as the director, right, my job is to convene and facilitate the discussion. Um, and I found that particularly challenge to do um, in an incredibly large room with um, leadership from our district attorney, police chiefs, elected judges, elective sheriffs scattered all over the place. It was, it was really hard to accomplish that. Um, but we had two uh, medical providers, one who was is the director of corrections health, um, and the other who is the former um, uh, public health leader for, for the tri-county area, which is Multnomah and two surrounding counties, really talk about what are the urgent things we're gonna have to start to figure out? Um, and what we really identified, like Mandy shared, is it feels that a lot of our decision making and the need to coordinate and communicate is based on two facilities, the jail and the courthouse. And in Multnomah County, those are about a block apart. And so that was really the ground zero of the conversation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit on the next set of questions about what we actually did. Um, and so after that meeting, um, I thought that what I needed to figure out was the best uh, cadence 
size and participation for all of our meetings. Um, ended up being twice a week. Uh, we met Wednesday mornings and Friday mornings. Um, and often meetings start to grow and get their own legs and people forward calendar invites. And so what started to be a very nimble and productive meeting with about 15 people, uh, conference calls, which I believe are wholly inadequate for this type of communication, grew to 50 people. Uh, it just grew. Um, to, so the public information officers and, you know, deputy directors and operations folks all wanted the information, which I thought was great, but it was no longer a meeting. It was me taking roll call and getting updates. And so um, with uh, being inspired by some hard questions from our sheriff's office, I decided to pivot. And what we now have is a monthly meeting so that all of our local and internal stakeholders can participate and hear what's going on and is it in the jail yet and all of the things that are happening. The answer to that is still no. Um, but our Friday meeting, yeah, fingers crossed, <laughs> so far so good. Our Friday meeting has really turned into an executive level internal family meeting of the criminal justice leadership. Um, I drive that agenda. It's myself, our two police chiefs the sheriff, the district attorney, the primary public defender, uh, the chief criminal judge, the presiding judge, and the chief probation officer. And there's about nine of us, and I have a couple of staff as well, and that's it. Um, and so that's how we've maintained coordination is figuring out who needs to be involved in what meetings. And because there was the culture of regular meeting, people really were able then to prioritize that for seven o'clock um, a couple days a week. Um, and it's been incredibly effective. Um, and I think one of the challenges and the opportunities has been the remote way of working and getting people to hang up the phone and turn on their computer and turn on the camera and look at each other in the eye, which I think is an incredibly important thing to do if you're collaborating. And if I couldn't see people's facial expressions or know if they're really engaged, it really hampered my ability to be an effective leader and facilitator of those processes. Um, and so I'm working really hard. I um, was really excited when our sheriff was able to join a Zoom meeting um, because the, the county just got the um, enterprise contract for Zoom because they increased their security. So prior to that, we had this format. We had WebEx and Google, but the courts and the city couldn't use Google, but they could use WebEx. And so all of the different firewalls and platforms that people couldn't, couldn't use was ridiculously stupid. And I'm sure the private sector was looking at us and just laughing. Um, but uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to maintain the effective meetings um, and have the right kind of leadership and the right kind of facilitation and really identifying the need to have quality video meetings is really the way to do that. Um, last thing I'll say until we, before we move on, is uh, we've identified the need to have a work session. Um, we have a big mountain of work ahead of us about how we're gonna do work differently, not just reopen, but do work differently. Um, so I think for the next couple of Fridays, we're gonna have three hour meetings, which I'm already exhausted just thinking about that, but that's okay, this is um, important times. Um, and lastly, when you're managing a bunch of leadership who run their own agencies, they have crises in their own agencies daily, multiple times a day. And to allow folks to address their own personal dumpster fires in, in what's going on, um, is it requires a lot of patience and a lot of relationship caretaking so that folks, everybody is in crisis constantly, but we still need to meet across systems. Um, and that enabled us to work with some uh, county communications and all of the public information officers to do, uh, we do, uh, we, I think we've had at least two press releases and lots of interviews. So trying to maintain a level of transparency as well, while we're all running around um, trying to just have good and effective collaboration as well. Thank you, Abby. It's really funny. You mentioned a conference call at the very beginning and I made a note and I was like, I, I want to ask her if she really meant conference call. And then you had a great discussion about getting people on this way. And, you know, it's a funny thing because you can sit in a, in a meeting, right? And you can kind of half tune out, you know, check your messages on your phone. And certainly when you're on a conference call, it's just audio. You definitely can do that. But this medium, it's much harder to tune out and you're making those social cues if you're not paying attention to what's going on. So it is a really valuable lesson I think we're all learning as we're all switching to using this medium more often. All right, so speaking of Abby and talking about other things, I'm actually gonna turn it back over to you to talk a little bit about 
uh, how you address the initial crisis, what adjustments you made, and really important to talk a little bit about um, how the adaption and the addressing of the crisis impacted anything you guys are doing in the behavioral health area. Mm -hmm. Right, I forgot that um, with Michael being sick, uh, you're gonna hear us, Mandy and I just keep talking. So then it's gonna be Mandy twice, I bet. Um, uh, no, it's not actually. Anyway, so uh, the how we address the initial crisis. So that morning on Friday, March uh, 13th, um, I was blown away when uh, one of our uh, deputy chiefs and the district attorney looked at each other and said, yeah, we're ready to do citation in lieu of booking for all non-mandatory arrest misdemeanors. Something we've been talking about as a system because we're a member of the safety and justice challenge and trying to reduce over-reliance on incarceration. I had to work really hard not to jump up and down and scream and shout my excitement about wanting to not book everybody. Um, but the crisis motivated a change to really try to do that. Um, so that was our first, we got to get the jail smaller. That is absolutely what we needed to do. Um, and so we decreased the jail size about 30% um, to allow for, um, as it sounds like there is um, an appropriate an amount of room for which folks are booked into the facility on mandatory misdemeanor arrests like domestic violence or felony charges, that they're able to be um, quarantined, not you know official quarantine, but really separated from the rest of the jail population for 14 days. Then the rest of the jail population is small enough now that folks are able to be in single cell housing um, and not be in open dorms, um, which is a harder way to um, socially distanced. Um, and also it's all because of the coordination between systems It's also about coordination between jurisdictions. Um, the cities run law enforcement through the police departments, the county runs probation, district attorney, and sheriff, and then the state is all courts. And so the chief, um, the chief justice of the Oregon Supreme Court was the one who made decisions about how the courts are going to function, giving the presiding judge in each county the ability to then operationalize how that looks, because in Multnomah County, the big, most populous county in the state, is going to look different than it does in smaller or more rural environments. Um, but we're not doing any out-of-custody hearings. So for any criminal case, if someone is not in jail, that case is not being heard. Um, Amy Whitman, who is also um, on this in this webinar um, interviewed our chief criminal judge because although we are not doing any out of custody um, hearings, we are doing in custody trials. So we had two trials last week, um, which was incredibly challenging and worrisome for some, uh, less worrisome for others. Um, PPE was provided to the jury and may imagine what it would be like to get a jury summons today and to have to go to, right? That'd be really something else. Um, but to allow for the jury to socially distance and they're in the normal seating area where the public sits and they're not in the jury box where, you know, you're 18 inches from each other. And then they, because we have um, open court, then we're live streaming the proceedings into a neighboring courtroom. So those, the, um, how we address the initial crisis was to dramatically decrease the jail size. Um, it has stabilized at about, it's about 775 people. Um, and then also managing having only in custody hearings in the courthouse. Um, so the attorneys are doing remote working as much as possible. Probation officers are doing a lot of phone and virtual check-ins. We are doing pretrial release, but it's all mostly phone contact whenever possible. Um, the one thing I also wanted to share is um, in terms of the behavioral health, our uh, uh, mental health judge, who's the former presiding judge, Nan Waller said, there is a digital divide, Abby. And the folks who don't have smartphones are unable to meaningfully engage in therapy. They're unable to do any sort of telehealth and that impacts the conditions of probation in their sentence and right, all of a sudden snowball terrible collateral consequences. And so that's something we're trying to do is invest in um, boxes and boxes of smartphones. I actually think we're gonna be able to get a bunch of iPhones and be able to provide those for folks pre-trial so that they can have better texting about court reminders. Because if someone was, was arrested on a non-person misdemeanor at the end of March, we don't even know when their case is gonna be arraigned. We need to be able to communicate with people. And that's on, that's on the system, that's not on the defendants to, to do that. 
Um, and then for post adjudication is where we really felt like folks who do not have access to smartphones and the accompanying data plan, which is another cost um, to, for the telehealth check ins and all of the things that folks need to do to be able to successfully complete programming um, and get get out of the system. Um, that's something that is uh, going pretty quick, quick and furious and I, and I think it's really the right way to go. So that I think has been our most um, the biggest impact for folks with behavioral health challenges is the access to care. Yeah, and I, I, I have heard about a, a couple of companies out there that are willing to provide the phones at a really inexpensive price. And some of them, uh, one of the companies I'm aware of, you know, it's, it's already pre set up for you if you're using it for post adjudication to do all the things that that person needs to do for um, either the health reasons or the supervision reasons. And it provides one more way that the probation officer, for example, can really communicate with uh, the person on probation. Neat stuff. Uh, Mandy, do you want to talk a little bit about the initial crisis and adjustments that you all made and any adaptions for behavioral health needs? Sure. Uh, as I spoke earlier, our response was probably around the same timelines that Abby had spoke to. It was that uh, uh, first full week in March, uh, around the 12th or 13th, I think our stakeholders initially convened to say, I think this is coming and we have to figure out what we're gonna do differently. And so our chief judge uh, speaks pretty regularly to a four-phased approach as I spoke earlier, uh, it was really trying to reduce the footprint, the employee footprint, and the number of people coming within our criminal courthouse complex. Uh, and then second to that was exactly what Abby had spoke to, was really rethinking about who's coming in our jail, who's currently in our jail, and how can we reduce the size of our jail. All things that we as a jurisdiction have been working on um, for the last, I would say, close to 10 years. Uh, looking at Milwaukee County's combined jail population, we have both a local um, downtown jail facility, which is meant for our pretrial population, and then we have a house of correction, which serves for our pretrial overflow, as well as um, our locally sentenced population for individuals under a year. And so uh, that jail population at certain times in the early 2000s was up in the ballpark of uh, 4,000 individuals. When we embarked on the MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge, our population was usually around 2,300. Uh, as of January this year, which was um, pretty much close to an all-time low through a, a collective of strategies, uh, we were at 1,800. In response to COVID-19, we have now gotten our population down into the 1200 range. So again, um, additional uh, reductions, which allow, it was multiple fold for our reasoning for doing that, for um, uh, recognizing that fewer people in custody during this time is absolutely necessary, but then also for our downtown jail facility, we wanted to make sure that we were able to maintain single cells, which Abby also talked to as a uh, uh, public health best practice. Additionally, our sheriff's office went to our public health department um, and our public health department has been a partner with us on this in recognizing that we wanted all staff and inmates access to tier one testing so that if anyone would be symptomatic, we could have access to tests as quickly as possible so that we could prevent and limit the spread of COVID-19 through either one of our facilities. Um, and then also, as Abby mentioned, we found, out, we found alternative means to uh, handling some of those uh, cases that all of our stakeholders felt as though should not be coming into the jail. So um, law enforcement too were very concerned about their safety because of the lack of access to PPE and wanting to limit their interactions with uh, individuals that we too agreed to uh, no jail bookings uh, for 
misdemeanors with the exception of domestic violence cases, uh, which is a mandatory arrest and booking. So um, there were a number of significant changes early on. And again, I think from our, our stakeholders being able to communicate well together, which I recognize in other jurisdictions feels really uh, foreign. Um, for example, uh, our public defender and our prosecutor uh, actually uh, work well together. They recognize their differences and disagree in certain ways on things. However, they have found a way to work together, um, which has really uh, accelerated our ability to collaborate across the board. And so um, uh, I mentioned the jail population reduction, the reduction in um, misdemeanor arrests and people coming into the system. And then also we've been working with our Department of Corrections. Our Department of Corrections is a state agency. Um, it's not under local control. So that has also been a partnership that we had to forge early on because anyone who would have any kind of violations of their probation would typically um, end up within our custody, county custody. And so uh, the state and the county began conversations to really look at like a jail population review team and finding out how individuals who are actually in the custody of the state but physically in the custody of the county, how we could come to some resolution to have those individuals outside of our care and custody. And I would say for um, the first month or so, we had great success in limiting uh, the entrance of COVID-19 into our facilities. We did have a brief outbreak within our House of Correction and uh, through a number of means, including uh, comprehensive testing across the entire facility and all of the staff, we're back down to uh, zero inmates within our House of Correction who have COVID-19. Same goes with staff. And we made that dashboard public so that, uh, again, for, for the sake of transparency and for the limitation and of rumor spreading, we wanted to be as forthcoming with information as we could because we have been coming about this with the best of intentions and wanting community to be uh, clearly uh, informed with accurate information. Along the way, we have made some adjustments. Uh, we've also tested some new things. Early on, um, we had to transition, thinking about public access to uh, court. We worked uh, to make sure that court was able to be streamed online, and we do that through YouTube now so that individuals uh, can still have the public access to court operations. But again, that is entirely foreign to our system, and we've had road um, bumps along the way. but. Uh, it was all part of the early transition into what now feels like a new normal. Um, and we continue to pivot as, as we need to. Um, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our jail population is down significantly, but as temperatures get warmer and we've had um, bookings increase a bit within our jail, our stakeholders continue to have to come have to come together to figure out how we're going to uh, maintain or continue to reduce our jail population where it's at to uh, prevent this uh, doubling up in cells, et cetera, et cetera. Regarding our behavioral health uh, adjustments, uh, we have been prior prioritizing uh, mental health diversion as one of our uh, key MacArthur Foundation safety and justice challenge strategies. And what that looks like for us is we have uh, co-responder models out in the community who continue to respond to cases. However, should someone end up within our jail facility who has severe and persistent mental illness, we are doing uh, a partnership with our community behavioral health system to then try and quickly expedite their release from custody. We continue to do that. Uh, however, it does look very different than it did when we had initially um, uh, built our roadmap to this, and we've been doing it now for about a year. Uh, our behavioral health partner, who used to be within the jail, now instead has to do uh, 
virtual offerings and um, continues to work with our prosecutor's office who also are working remote. And so we continue to work through those challenges, uh, but we have found great progress in being able to, you know, kind of work through those hurdles. What feels really big in the beginning ends up uh, we're able to work through them and have uh, been successful thus far. So, Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to do a quick check in with Risa. Have we had any questions? Um, no, we haven't had any questions or comments. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I'm finding the conversation extremely interesting. I hope everybody else is. Um, you know, I just, you know, maybe just for, you know, the sake of um, recognizing that um, the folks on the call today are MHTC grantee sites, um, you know, just hoping that you are able to translate this conversation into if you maybe don't have an official criminal justice coordinating council, but you have pulled together a planning team for your grant or some sort of um, collaborative cross-system decision-making body that I hope you're able to, you know, be able to um, understand the role that that, that body can play, uh, particularly during the COVID-19 medical crisis, um, and just the opportunities, you know, to be that one place where everybody can come together for um, system-wide decision-making. So I would say carry on. Um, we've Great. got just a few minutes left. Well, uh, sort of bridging over to the last set of questions, uh, uh, Abby, I'm really glad you brought up the uh, interview that Amy did. If you all haven't had a chance, or I don't know if any of you have read or are subscribing to JMI's website, it's on our website. It's, it's a really, really good interview. It was fascinating to me to read how you all were able to do that during those jury trials. Um, and of course, I think the most important thing that I learned from reading that was that it's really not any fun right now. And it takes way too many resources to try to do it. But I, I it, it was just, it was really fascinating. So if, if anybody has time to take a look at that, I'd, I'd recommend it, especially if you're thinking about having to do that yourselves. And bridging on to the, the, the last set of questions, which is talking about the reopening and how you all are sort of planning for that and what those next steps look like. And I know we were gonna do back and forth, but I think it actually makes sense to go back to Abby, surprise. <laughs> And then we'll go back to Mandy, and we're we are at uh, seven minutes to the top of the hour, so maybe we can kind of be a little bit brief here. And then if there's any mm -hmm. remaining questions at the end, great. Um, so in terms of reopening, um, the you know the the conversation that's happening in Oregon is it's going to be really slow. Um, we are taking the governor's lead, uh, and then counties can figure out how to make sure that they meet all of the criteria necessary to begin a reopening process, and it is phased. Um, as I mentioned, um, Portland um, and Multnomah County being the most populous, we will be last. And then congregate settings within those more populous areas will be last as well. So all of our shelters and jails and um, um, uh, congregate settings will be the last um, to go back to business as usual. So how I'm working with my system partners to plan for, um, I keep calling it the mountain of work ahead of us, um, is not going back to business as, normal, as usual because I think business as usual is really based in, uh, in an oppressive um, and uh, systemically racist and classist system. Um, and I don't want to go back to that. And we fear that if we just go back to arresting, booking, adjudicating, and sentencing people, we're going to turn into a criminal justice mill just to get the cases disposed. And that's not a good way of doing business. And the return on investment there is actually pretty terrible. Um, so I'm going to look at my other screen for a minute. So I've created um, a structure for people in order to take these next steps um, and how to figure out how to reopen in a new world. Our budgets are tanking. Um, we are having some crime go up. Most crime is down, some crime is up. Um, there is a digital divide. How do we take all of these problems and actually look at them as solutions? So we have six areas we're talking about. One is technological solutions, like doing better texting with folks about, about court hearings and giving people phones, like I discussed, to have conversations with their attorneys. People should be able to call into court. People should be able to call into court. So we're just trying to figure out how to eliminate some of those sort of old school ways of thinking and just like, let's get 21st century about this. 
Um, as I already mentioned, buying lots and lots of cell phones for both pre-adjudication and post-adjudication individuals, we want to create some expedited dockets. For the person who was arrested for a misdemeanor two or three months ago, is it really any kind of justice to just, let's be creative about this and think about ways to work through cases more efficiently and more thoughtfully. We do want to implement our pretrial justice work, which is what we just got funded by the MacArthur Foundation to do. Um, and so it fits well under that as well. Um, we also want to talk about how to do things differently. What are things that we should stop doing? Or what are the things that we should look at differently or continue to pivot? And last but not least, uh, the Local Public Safety Coordinating Council is in the process of going through a long-term visioning process. We just started to do this um, in the process of contracting with a, with a consultancy, um, and we just need the work to fit, fit in with that. Um, my biggest concern is that we go back to normal, normal, um, and my mantra with everybody is there is no normal. There is no normal. So considering um, what's going on, those are the approaches we're taking. Or the new normal. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mandy, what do you what do you have for challenges with reopening, and specifically to what you were talking about uh, the last time for the last slide, you were talking about some of the ways to try to keep the jail population down. And I'm mm -hmm. curious if you have uh, isolated those things that you want to try to figure out how to continue going. Uh, one of the things that we hope to carry through into the era of new normal is our jail population review team that is regularly going through uh, lists of individuals who are in custody. And that population review team uh, consists of, uh, you know, defense, prosecution, and a court official. Uh, working together collaboratively so that uh, resolutions can be discussed. I think so much of what Abby hit on is exactly what we're doing here within Milwaukee County. Uh, it will be slow. Uh, our chief judge has been sitting on our chief justices uh, task force on looking at statewide reopening. And some of the, the things being written into that uh, protect public safety. However, even as a jurisdiction in the size that we are, we ha may struggle to do in a timely fashion, like offering PPE to everyone who enters the facility, doing temperature checks, hand sanitizer stations everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. Social distancing for jury panels. Um, we're calling in over 800 people a week for jury, you know, uh, jury pools, and so how, what is that going to look like? And so we have a lot of, we have committees meeting at the state level, we have committees meeting locally to think that through, because again, Milwaukee County in comparison to the, the rest of the state is one of the most populous uh, in the state, if not the most populous when I think about that. And so um, we will be a unique outlier in comparison to rest of the state. So. A lot of planning, um, but I think we're going to, based on what I'm hearing from my leadership, everyone is wanting to do it in a safe way and not uh, race forward quickly. And so my, I don't have, I was one of those people who voted that we don't have an open date for our uh, courts at this time. We're just trying to do the best that we can in, in thinking through everything uh, with public health at top of mind. Great, hey, thank you. So, Riza, how's that? I left one whole minute for you to finish up with the last slides. Well, first of all, I want to um, thank you, Robin, Abby, and Mandy. Um, again, the conversation's been really great this afternoon for all of us. Um, and um, just, um, you know, take us to that next to last slide for some closing comments. Um, again, very pleased to have this um, collaborative relationship um, to assist our grantees with JMI. And just as our um, coming soon attraction to announce um, is that we do have some, um, not a lot, a lot, but we do have some slots, some opportunity for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance uh, from JMI. Um, and whether it would be from this conversation, which has been um, you know, focusing how you can strengthen your collaborative, um, particularly with 
you know, the lens on the pandemic, but, you know, in general, too, if, if there's other issues, challenges, anything going on with your particular collaborative, um, you could make a, a direct request to your Justice Center, JMHCPT, and let them know that you listened to the webinar and you would be interested in um, receiving some uh, very short-term technical assistance, uh, which would probably end up being a peer-to-peer -peer match with one of the um, several sites that are, are part of the, um, the criminal justice network through JMI. And we are at 301. I know that that's just a, a we I think pulled this together very timely for you all. I hope it was helpful. And again, just want to say thank you to our panelists today. Have a great rest of the day. Yeah, thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.